Ah, yeah. You want to focus more on technical stuff, yeah. not uh, legal. Yeah, no, legal stuff. Those are, I, it's, I think it's just too much. But mm. I, it was, it was very interesting to me, and it, I think it would be a nice way to know that. Yeah, but uh, for example, legal, uh, legal things are you can like it's only just part of the whole question, mm. and so it it contains like. When you want to solve the problem of uh, governance in SSI, you need to tackle also legal uh, from you. You need to look from legal side, also from technical side. Uh, so yeah, but but yeah, you still have some time. So yeah, think about that. Yeah, and I was also wondering uh, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, defense companies. Ah. Yeah, like uh, finding some resources could be challenging uh, in this sense. Yeah, but I don't. I don't think you have to, uh, uh, like, yeah, like and narrow down so much. But but yeah, um, let's discuss it on, on Thursday. Uh, we can schedule a meeting. And what else? Benjamin, we talked about his topic, so he had. Yeah, a bit general topic. What about you, Alexander? Did you manage to? Yeah, I did a how you can send the different messages mm -hmm. over the internet and how you can have a uh, service endpoint from the internet to that service. So you are already you already started like uh, finding ways how to send it like yeah, transfer yeah. message. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Look at the different uh, installations that it is. Yeah. Um, That's great. Uh, yeah it will be between agents or between wallets so so you can assume they are users basically yeah. so you can look into this uh, veramo or hyperledger framework because they have quite um, uh, already implementations existing uh, and also, uh, I think the guy in bachelor course, he used uh, did key, I think. Yeah. It's a bit different, yeah? Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, try to study the current state of the art and uh, um, finding out like what, what has been done regarding this transportation layer uh, and try to identify some really good challenges that you can convert it to some sort of research questions. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but... Um, yeah, that's right, but the challenge will be how to integrate it to your stuff. Uh, and also you can focus on offline and online, uh, like uh, sending, set, setting up communication. Yeah. I'm not sure how I could, or if I would use the whole system. Or if I would do it from scratch. Yeah. I want to 
Yeah, I, I, I also don't think it was uh, popular in hyperledger frame. Okay. So you, you are free to use anything. So you can start from scratch, but just uh, look into this thesis to like, because he has done some work and he has passed some challenges when he was doing that. So you can, uh, yeah, learn from, uh, from him, like, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, you, you are free to change your uh, focus and change the language and the uh, lead method. Because yeah, I also think that he isn't very popular. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so Himali, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen you before. First class. So yeah, uh, we are uh, trying to finalize our <laughs> topics for this project. Um, so as you can see, not like students has, uh, haven't finished everything. So you are not um, late, so you have time. Um, in GitLab, we uh, Marius uh, wrote some uh, topics. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you have time um, to look into the topics and try to identify what is interesting to you. And uh, if you uh, if you find, if you have some idea, you can write down, create a page, and write down your topic. Uh, and also, you can contact me or Marius to have a meeting to discuss your topic. But you should have some idea in your mind before that, so we can uh can have a meeting after that um, so for next uh thursday uh, there will not be any lecture but you can uh you can have a meeting with me or marius okay so you just contact marius or me to set up a meeting okay besnik uh small topic change Uh, what was your topic, Pesnik? Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me right now. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, I chose the federated learning uh, one. I think I fixed the issue now. I created the page on the wrong section, so it wasn't showing up on your end. Yeah, it wasn't showing before, but let me up upgrade, uh, refresh it. I think I fixed it. I'm not, I'm not sure it's showing up on the right section on my end for now, but. Yeah, I can see federated learning, yeah. yeah. So uh, can you briefly uh, explain what, what you, you'll be focusing? Uh, I, I am currently just researching the entire, uh, the general notion behind it, but um, my initial interest was in the privacy preserving mechanisms uh, regarding federated learning, but I'm also quite interested in the uh, learning process uh, in general as well, like the way they generalize, because uh, one uh, node can overfit the model and then the other node would have to get the parameters from another node and then uh, learn on top of it. So I am a bit confused on which uh, subtopic I would want to follow, but for now I am just keeping Preserve, uh, privacy preserving mechanisms as my um, main scope. I see. So the topic is very interesting, to be honest. And uh, Marius has uh, quite experience with that. So he has done some proposals and uh, have worked uh, in some projects regarding federated learning. Uh, there was one use case with uh, hospitals in Norway. So uh, for example, hospitals uh, cannot exchange data between each other uh, in a privacy preserving manner. So uh, there was one proposal which was done by Marius before. So yeah, you can discuss with Marius, I think. He's more experienced in federated learning. And for now, yeah, just study and study the current state of the art. That is my plan for now. Yeah. So uh, who else left? Uh, there was one person who was focusing on smart contracts. Deepesh? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was uh, planning to go uh, just on smart contracts uh, previously, but now um, I will be trying to focus on the smart contracts with the DeFi side involved in it. 
so i have been uh, in touch with marius regarding how uh, how to uh, get the specific topics for for those two things so yeah i i will probably have a meeting with him uh, sometimes uh, this week yeah right yeah but uh, i have already created the page i think you can see it in the defi section oh uh, yeah decentralized finance yeah. so you are focusing on defi and the uh, application of smart contracts uh, yeah. but you haven't identified any issues here yet uh, uh, no not yet i'm just uh, researching for now yeah okay at least you have some general topic yeah great decentralized finance space is also like booming so like currently mostly in ethereum network you can find many uh, projects companies working on that space mm. so i think you find uh, interesting challenge challenges that you can solve maybe tackle yeah yeah exactly so that there's a lot of areas that can be explored so i'm i'm just trying to uh, find one specific topic that that's more easy for me to uh, focus on yeah right but uh, did you uh, have um, experience with smart contracts before uh no development wise i don't have any experience but i'm currently learning uh, trying to learn yeah okay okay great um then i think we we covered everyone so um yes so some of you created the topics in gitlab but you haven't put anything so the next step is to identify um, like narrow down your focus and write a, write a paragraph with research questions if you can so that will be the task for next next week uh, this thursday uh, i will have i mean i can have a meeting with some of you if you wish and marish probably also he is he isn't here yet uh, he's in Poland, but he'll be back next week. So, yeah. so for this week, we will study uh, this. Uh, I have sent you uh, two papers. If you, uh, if you, if you see, it, saw it. So uh, one was regarding selective disclosure application, and second was authentication protocols. Uh, so first part of lecture, I will just cover uh, briefly. Uh, about these topics, and then we will uh, go through these papers. But I hope you have read it. So how to move it? Okay. So um, what's selective disclosure? Um, <clears throat> so when we use um, internet, like we would like to. Uh, use it in a privacy preserving manner. So we don't want our uh, PII, like personal identifier information to leak. So the minimizing this data disclosure is uh, one, of, uh, one of the great features if it's implemented correctly. So uh, as you can see from this UI, you have passport uh, with some data, for example, but when you're disclosing it to, <clears throat> when you are sharing it with someone digitally, you, you should have a, a choice to, uh, uh, to not show some of the data, for example, date of birth, maybe you don't want to show it, like or some stuff, for example. Or, uh, or. so, uh, so when users share information, they should be able to choose what and how much they share on a case by case basis. Uh, basically, that process is called selective disclosure of data. Uh, have you seen such a feature in in current web? Like, for example, when you interact with some websites, have you seen such feature or like, um, for example, when you log into some web service, was was there any option to choose? Actually, there is. Uh, there was. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have seen it in bank ID or some stuff. So they, yeah. they, uh, they show you what they are taking, like 
personal number and stuff, but you don't have options to pick, but they at least show you like they are uh, taking this data or some, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there are some sort of, but not uh, ideal solutions yet, I think, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we have like three players that we discussed last uh, week. So we have issuer, uh, we have prover, who is uh, a subject or who is a user, for example. We have verifier. And uh, when you want to implement selective disclosure credentials or some methods, uh, they need to satisfy uh, these properties. So first property is uh, the prover convinces the verifier that he holds a credential with attributes that satisfy some Boolean formula. So yeah, so he can uh, he should be able to show uh, prove that he his age, for example, or city, his Cambridge, and so on, like uh, the, the things that he needs to prove. Second is prover uh, cannot lie, uh, so it shouldn't uh, it should be impossible. Uh, third thing is verify cannot infer anything else aside the formula. So from this thing, other other things shouldn't be learned from uh, by a verifier. And anonymity maintained despite despite collusion of V and I. So verifier and issuer. So uh, despite their collusion, uh, they sh they shouldn't be able to get uh, the data. So this is the properties uh, that uh, selective disclosure should satisfy. Uh, this is just example. For example, if a prover wants to. So he gets his uh, passport from issuer and wants to show his, uh, uh, so he wants to verify and enter bar and bar staff asks, uh, checks his age. So he needs just age and uh, he should be able to uh, prove that his age above 21 or some stuff, but uh, sh he shouldn't disclose any other, other information because there is no need actually. Uh, so in uh, in SSI, uh, in in the context of SSI, selective disclosure is best implemented through verifiable credentials that we have uh, focused last week. So uh, so basically, when you are showing or sharing your credentials, uh, presenting your verifiable credentials, uh, it should contain just the data needed for verification. Yeah, but it's easy to say, but how it how it should be done, for example. Because when you get the verifiable credential from issuer, like let's say from bank, it 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 signs it with its uh, like signature, yeah. So when and verifier verifies his signature, like issuer's signature. But but when you want to uh, split that credential and show some of the attributes or like some part of the credential, uh, it 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 would be a problem because uh, you cannot break the signature that uh, issuer give you, like uh, and uh, and uh, verifier cannot. Um, Verify it basically. So the, 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 there should be some mechanism or some new sort of signature uh, which allows you to do that. Uh, VC data model spec is, uh, is is a standard that I have sent you last week. So it provides some guidance on how to do so, but it doesn't uh, clearly uh, show you how to do it. So as any other standard, because standards don't show you how to implement uh, things. It, 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 uh, it's left to developers. Um, so digital identity walls are also a crucial part here uh, because they, 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 they need to implement this uh, selective disclosure in a user-friendly way. So, the, uh, so users can use it and understand what's happening and it should be easy for them. Uh, so let's discuss how we can uh, implement like well, or how what kind of approaches we have for for selective disclosure currently uh, so uh, like when it comes to solutions for selective disclosure of verifiable credentials there are many different ways to tackle this problem yeah but we'll cover only three of them the first one is just in time issues so when you um, when you are verifying or sharing uh, your credential with verifier you you will contact the issuer at, at request time uh, and and ask uh, like uh, from the issuer and I mean he signs your credentials again maybe at that time request time so it's one way 
second way is trusted witness. So you will use some trusted witness between the provider and the relying party to mediate the information disclosure. So basically uh, you will have some middleman who is trusted by you and verifier, which is like not really good way actually. Uh, third is cryptographic solutions. So you use some cryptographic technique to disclose a subset of information from larger assertions. So there is no need for, verifi uh, for verifier to contact issuer or like, uh, that's the third option, which uh, which I think is the most efficient. For example, just in time issues. Actually, just in time issues is a model used by OpenID Connect. So it's it's a uh, it's what we have now. For example, when you use Facebook login, it uh, like uh, when you log into some web service uh, website and uh, you use Facebook login, it uh, redirects you to Facebook server or like and uh, connects to Facebook and he sends, uh, Facebook sends some tokens uh, to you. And uh, so like, it's 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 uh, like during request time, you contact the issuer. So we assume that the issuer is highly available. So we assume that Facebook is available online. So he can give you that such a token at that time, uh, which creates an infrastructure burden on the issuer uh, because he, sh he should be available he should be able to uh, resolve all requests by uh, by subjects because at at, uh, at one time there might be uh, thousands of requests. Uh, so ah one 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 important thing here is uh, in this model uh, uh, when when uh, when you for example log into some service uh, that uh, for example uh, Facebook will learn that you. Uh, I mean, he learns what you what you are doing. So every time you log into some other website, he, uh, Facebook will know. Uh, I didn't like like what what's happening. So that's a privacy problem because it you you will be trackable. This is the model with what we currently have, basically. Yeah, uh, trusted witness. I think this model is mostly used not digitally, but in physically. So for example, you want to prove something to one person uh, that you don't know, maybe. And you can find someone who knows both of you. And uh, he, he could be a witness for you, like uh, saying like, just trust him. And uh, uh, so the verifier can trust uh, that person. Oh uh, yeah. No, this is uh, bank ID is the first one, basically because uh, when you. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But every time uh, that web service uh, it redirects to, to bank ID, and bank ID verifies you. So that's just in time mission basically. Uh, bank ID is an issue. Is there any the second one uh, because uh, this trust witness let's study it so it's um, yeah so there is there will be some middleman between you and verifier uh, who will be witness and who is trustable yeah but uh, this isn't scalable you know because you cannot find a uh, not really scalable so it's not used most I think but it, maybe you can find some some platforms that you use there, yeah, but I never used it, but yeah. Mm. But in bank ID, it's it's similar to the first case. So it's like <clears throat> his issuer just issues bank ID and you can use it anywhere, yeah. Yeah, but every time it uh, there, there is communication with bank ID to get the token or some stuff to verify you, so yeah. So you assume that the bank ID is always uh, on uh, online, yeah, available. Uh, Third is cryptographic solutions. So basically, in a simple words, by cryptographic solutions, we mean that, as I said, like uh, it's hard for verifier to verify the signature of issuer. Uh, when you split the credentials or when you um, disclose a part of them. 
So there are some cryptographic solutions or cryptographic uh, digital signature methods that allow you to do that uh, by default, basically. So you don't have to co uh, contact issue at, at that time. So uh, the most popular approach is uh, zero knowledge proofs, for example, and also uh, which allows uh, to prove knowledge of some data without uh, exposing the, any additional data. But for zero no, uh, knowledge proofs to work, you need some sort of other digital signatures. So not current uh, methods we have. So uh, one, one example is uh, multi-message digital signatures such, such as BBS Plus. So it's a new method uh, uh, which was proposed recently. Uh, I will talk about that later here, I think. So we traditionally we have this, this structure. So uh, when we have key pair, private and pub public key, uh, which you can use to produce a digital signature. And when, uh, when the message is signed, uh, it's signed by uh, issue private key and you have signature. And when verified, mess when message is verified, you use issues public key and plus signature. So, and you can uh, get a true and false. Like the second uh, thing is for verifier. It's what we have here, mm. which is quite simple, but it doesn't work for selective disclosure, as I said, because if you split the message, uh, this uh, system will be broken. And you will not, uh, like this equation will not, Mm, work, yeah. And by multi message, uh, one second. Can stop here. So, in multi message digital signature, you uh, you have some sort of array. Yeah, so you can. Uh, so issuer can sign it uh, every uh, part of the array. So we, uh, with its uh, private key. And when, uh, when verifying, uh, you have a choice, like you can show just part of these messages uh, and still get like true and false. So it's how uh, multi-message digital signature, signature schemes work uh, on a high level. One example is BBS Plus. You can uh, look into that um, uh, by Googling it and finding out uh, like, yeah, how it works exactly. It worked like that, but in, in more detail, you can find out. Uh, and what it gives to us. In the context of verifiable credentials, each message corresponds to a claim in the credential. Uh, so for example, uh, basically, uh, here we have verifiable credential, some sort of like maybe uh, passport, for example. And every message is a claim. Claim is basically date of birth or like uh, passport number and issuance date and some sort of like different claims. So uh, when you're constructing the signing, like when you're doing it, you will do it uh, in a way that you can split it when you are verifying it. So it's quite a good idea to have it. So, and when you, uh, and in the process of verification, you can just, uh, for example, disclose, disclose some part of claims, not all of that, but still get uh, verification basically. Uh, what is this? Yeah, it's the same thing that I, I mentioned here. So when deriving the proof, so yeah, the derived proof is still uh, says that uh, like all messages have been signed so everything is right and the integrity of messages like uh, uh, will be kept despite you for example uh, hide some some claims for example so uh, 
this is cryptographic method and uh, this method actually uh, i think more efficient because uh, in this case uh, verifier and issuer uh, don't have to interact with each other uh, they can just verify it um, and it's quite uh, it's scalable if you implement it uh, um, by default so you don't have to It makes the system easier a bit. So the second part, we will talk about authentication. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's have a 10 minutes break. So uh, in the second part, we will talk about authentication protocols, and then we'll discuss the papers. Yes. Okay. I, I will pause recording. So uh, I had, I think, one uh, when I sent you an email, I, uh, at the end, I listed some terms, so like, uh, so you can have a look what are they. You could actually find the answers from papers, and also you could look into on the web. Uh, so one question is was about like what is authentication and what is authorization? The difference. Can yeah, please. Yeah, you are allowed to is authorization, and yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Who so you are? Yeah. And authorization is what what you can do, like what you have access to do. Uh, because some people confuse what because the terms are quite similar, but they are different. So for authentication, we have some mechanisms currently. So we can use uh, passwords, uh, like some pin or code, or we can use like tokens, uh, which is a case of this Open ID Connect. Uh, or we can use directly our private keys to verify uh, and to log in. Uh, and also in some cases, we can use biometrics. But, but biometrics, uh, I mean, it's widely used in our mobile phones, but uh, you cannot, usually you cannot use it, I think, in some high security level uh, websites. Yeah? Yeah, with your fingerprint, but uh, you have uh, low access for that. When, for example, okay, we have bank ID application, yeah, like well, like bank application, but uh, you have some options. And when you choose fingerprints, yeah, you have access to that, but it's like more like uh, how to say, just showing you, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I have seen it. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I have seen such kind of looking. I mean, it's it's quite widely used. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think there are. Yeah, uh, I think just just the problem is like uh, it has some. Um, th there are some probability of uh, false, uh, which is low, but but still, 
And also the second, second case, the hardware should be, uh, like with high probability, it should be reliable. If we tackle that problems, I think it, it will be okay. Uh, so I have uh, uh, mentioned OpenID protocol. So we'll go through that now. So OpenID protocol uh, enables websites and applications uh, to grant access. Um, uh, you have seen it from like uh, Google and Facebook sign-in or some other. Um, and we have also uh, OAuth, it's for authorization. So not just login, uh and verifying who you are but also you can uh, this protocol enables uh websites and applications to access the protected resources like so it's basically a right access like what you can do uh when you after you log in all this actually is some sort of federated authentication so not really decentralized version but uh, it's some sort of federated authentication Uh, yeah, you have seen it widely. So it was, uh, I think, implemented in 2006. Uh, and we have authorization version in 2010. And, uh, and in 2014, it, they were merged and we have OpenID Connect protocol, so which allows you to authenticate and authorize so both of that works and all all of them are standardized so uh, i'm not sure about st like statistics how uh, how widely it's used in uh, in the internet but uh, but i have only seen like um, the big players use it like uh, for example facebook google and mozilla or some Twitter maybe, uh, but for small players, uh, it, it, it isn't very widely used. Yep. Yeah, but the question was like, uh, when I looked, I think it wasn't very uh, popular. As I said, like there are many websites that just, just don't use the new technology. So uh, I think it's like around less than 30%, maybe the 20% uh, of the websites use or rely on this federated or like more reliable user-friendly ones as in this case. So, uh, and yeah, lots of them just use passwords and logins, as I mentioned in the first method. Uh, and even some don't have this uh, HTTPS security level. <laughs> so yeah, so it could leak your uh, passwords. Yeah, I think, uh, when I mentioned it, uh, new addresses of people who Oh, yeah, that is a problem. That is a problem as well. Uh, I just know that it, it wouldn't be a fast uh, 
also has for the remember this is complicated and requires a little bit of overhead and for having high passwords and first passwords and running great things they can come to us with fingers and one to the one this and that. I know I deal with a lot of And I feel like there is a very big for a lot of the small things and things we have in security that we need to be concerned Which is why I guess probably we will sell the store probably we put all this more store stuff into our data center in the future. And same with Facebook and Twitter and Google. And yeah, you want to maintain that kind of anonymity, but there's no body needs to maintain. Not that like Twitter and Google just like for things to see to see feedback from them. Yeah. And there are so many things that don't even have to happen. Yeah. So, Compared to yeah, I agree, like the first level login methods, like just password login, these methods are better. So yeah, at this stage, uh, for regarding SSI logins. They are at development stage, so yeah, basically, uh, it's called like it's called Web two, and uh, decentralized applications are called Web three, so it's the next level, but it will take time uh, to, like, so everyone can integrate it easily, yeah. Uh, I think uh, we can have a Yeah. That's right. I mean, um, standardization is one, one, one way, one way to push it further. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing to mention is like um, for example, these technologies were implemented like 2010, like already 10 years. So, but still it, it didn't get widespread use. And from SSI, it will have also its challenges, uh, some sort of, uh, I think. So it will take time. Uh, for decentralized methods to get a widespread use. Even though here they have this Facebook and Twitter and like big players in place, they are supporting this method, but still, uh, yeah, not, not so wide, widespread use. Yeah, as I said, like OpenID Connect is based on tokens. So uh, these tokens define, for example, uh, what you can do. And also uh, like uh, how, how long you can have access basically. So it's uh, it defines the time also. And after time expires, your token expires basically. Um, so it's usually JSON-based tokens. Uh, there is a standard uh, called JWT, JSON Web Token. Does anyone know what is it? It's an old edition. 
yeah, it's a token that is used for authentication, but JWT is just like how to say the name of the standard because these tokens should be standardized. So everyone follows the same uh, pattern. So it's just a standard of how to wrap it, like how to, uh, what to include, for example, and what kind of signatures to use. So it's, I think just JWT is, uh, it's a part of standard which uh, defines uh, the structure of this token basically. But it's JSON basically, but there are some like it's signature, it could be encrypted, for example, it could be uh, sign up si signature and uh, encryption is optional. So you can just put, uh, send unencrypted version, but, but it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have talked about that. So uh, single sign-on is uh, is the implementation of by OpenID Connect, and but Facebook calls it Facebook Connect, so they just renamed it a bit. And Samo is also a similar protocol, but uh, it's for enterprises mostly used. And Microsoft possibly has its own, but I never use it. Yeah, I oh, know I use it. Because I think our uh, NTNU logins are. I had to install this authenticator by Microsoft to login. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I uninstalled my email from, uh, from, from my mobile phone because of that. Is that thing broken, by the way? Why is it supposed to be so? <laughs> I I yeah I mean Every time I read a question, yeah, I'm close to have an ultimate second. I have to sign in. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be very good. I'm not sure it's going to be very good. Yeah, I think this Microsoft things always aren't very good in terms of. I think it's a problem of how to say Microsoft, like how they implement it, like not not quite user friendly. You you, you don't have to uh, log in every time. I think it should be. Yeah, because of that, I don't have this email. I mean, Outlook email in my phone now. I mean, anti new email. Because really? Yeah, I also check on my laptop because it has some uh, requirements for security of your phone. So it requires also to change the password for my phone. So it should be some standard like eight numbers or something. So, so it's quite complicated. They ask a lot, 
of stuff to do to satisfy their requirement. So I just uninstalled it, but but I don't know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, when you install this Outlook, possibly they ask your password to be stronger when, when just a simple password to log in your so they, so so they dictate like uh, the password but it's i think it's a new thing mostly yeah no not no, no. yeah <laughs> so, so, yeah sometimes they say like i i log in some some website and they say like uh it's uh it's very widespread password, <laughs> but i i thought like it's my password is strong but kind of like it's it's used in other places so <laughs> well <laughs> i had it yeah so um so let's talk about the pros and cons of this login mechanism um so it's an open standard so which is good um it works uh, uh, it supports many applications and because it was uh, pushed by these big players uh, so it relies on https and also it relies on json web tokens as i said but both are standards uh, secure standards and drawbacks are like uh, yeah so as i said like a, a single sign on uh, relies on uh, this av availability so the issue should be available online and uh, it makes the system more expensive i would say uh, and also uh, there are some um, attacks like denial of access attacks or something uh, which could break or crush the system easily uh, and here it mentions as i said like it's still less common solution in the market uh, yeah so as as benjamin said like still lots of local websites don't use these mechanisms at least and https is the only layer of encryption and trust between application and identity provider compromised certificate a single sign integration shouldn't be trusted yet. so basically single sign-on is rely, uh, relying on https <coughs> security so if https uh, isn't reliable uh, i mean single sign-on is also but i think it's okay because every website uses HTTPS now, uh, so we can skip it. So this model is uh, what we have now. So for example, we have, <clears throat> uh, we, well, we are here. So we are, we, let's assume we are a holder and we want to verify um, something, for, uh, some credentials which we took from Azure and uh, and verifier relies on identity provider like Facebook or some stuff, uh, which uh, helps you to go uh, go through this process basically. And the the thing is that the data is uh, data used for authentication is stored in centralized databases, uh, and users uh, usually lack control of over their data in such system. Also, it's kind of user friendly and it's developer developer friendly because you just uh, can put a uh, single sign on on your website and it's it's done kind of but but yeah but but the, the, this solution is what we have now is uh, like the most how to say efficient usable user-friendly one but it has these drawbacks and it should be solved so we we are moving to the next level now so, uh, in self serving identity ecosystem, uh, this uh, we have holder, issuer, and verifier. We don't have identity provider like middleman. And also, one thing to note that we don't have direct connection between issuer and verifier. So they don't have to every time uh, contact each other, which makes the system more scalable, more uh, more efficient, and cost for, uh, cost efficient also. So they just can check the uh, signatures on some uh distribute uh, decentralized networks and 
Uh, yeah, so the information is no longer centralized because Holder can store it, uh, the, his data anywhere. And, and also we will rely on decentralized identifiers, which also don't rely on this certificate authorities for issuance. So, uh, which is also, uh, yeah. So users can choose to store, manage data on their mobile phones or, or some cloud services also. So users will have more, like more control in this ecosystem. And when authenticating, authenticating, you uh, should prove that you own that DID, for example. So it's called DID OS, like DID authentication. So you need to prove that you own that DID uh, to the verifier. Um, so we, we I, I think we covered it. Uh, we have DID document, which stores uh, authentication mechanisms, uh, public keys, and this, uh, Verification is actually done by resolving your DID to DID document and checking your um, signatures and public key. Yeah. Uh, here it's just one example of. So uh, in SSI, it's similar to what we have currently. So it's just like you send. Uh, a challenge and you get response and uh, but just re re resolving your DID happens in some uh, through some decentralized network like blockchains and yeah otherwise it's quite similar uh, mechanism uh, here I wanted to mention like there was one um, one part in OpenID Connect which was called selfie should OpenID Connect uh, uh, it's it's basically similar to uh, SSI, so it means like uh, everyone can uh, be its own issuer. So you can uh, you can be issuer of your credential uh, and uh, enter uh, like and verify and send ver ver verifiers your credentials. But it isn't used now because uh, yeah, I mean it's it's not used at all because uh, it's quite hard for. Uh, users to set up this for themselves so uh, it didn't get widespread use at all but uh, for did and uh, verifiable credentials uh, i mean it has more support uh, and community so it, it might take off uh, for papers let's discuss this one Yeah, here. So first one was distributed ledger-based authentication uh, with uh, decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials. Cannot move this way. Ah, I see. It's just a PowerPoint. Here. Have you read this paper? Yeah, it, it's quite simple. I mean, yeah, and a short paper. So uh, here they wanted to, um, I think I have, yeah, so that's right. So they wanted to integrate this decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials with OpenID uh, protocol. So that, that was the main goal. Uh, 
so that OpenID protocol can use GIDs and verifiable credentials, which is, I think, a good idea because uh, I think there is no need to implement such protocols again, so you can integrate it with SSI mechanisms. So he, they give some introduction regarding the, uh, the challenges that we have. So they mentioned that, um, yeah, what we have now, like Facebook login, Google login, and uh, how these protocols, we, we covered that. Okay, let's keep it. So the main contributions of papers, he says like reviewing SSI authentication methods. So he, they reviewed the current state of their art for SSI first, then they implemented and evaluated self-server and authentication for uh, OpenID Connect. So they integrated OpenID Connect with SSI uh, authentication, and uh, they have uh, done some proof of concept and some evaluation. Analyzing benefits of SSI powered PKI. What's PKI? Yeah, yeah, right, that's right. So, uh, <clears throat> The benefit of SSI powered uh, PKI means uh, decentralized PKI basically. But uh, can anyone say like how uh, public key cryptography works? Can you can anyone explain? Like first, yeah. One. Uh, you can make two steps. Yeah. Yeah. Using your key. So you encrypt uh, when you are sending the message. You encrypt it with your private key. Private key or public key. Uh huh. So you can uh, encrypt it with your private key. Your public key. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's that's right. But uh, how they um, how they for example verify how they identify that your public key is trustful, or how they find out your public key for them. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, CI, so um, that stores a digital uh, credential, which are uh, which makes that public key on the uh, identities. Yeah, that's so right. It's, it's a so for um, for like how to they tr uh, how verifier trusts public keys because public keys are uh, verified by these certificate agencies uh, which are centralized like they they uh, they uh, so because of that we are like trusting these public keys basically uh, so it's quite centralized in a sense but uh, it's working. Or a centralized network of knowledge. Yeah. And in, in, a, in a case of decentralized one, it's stored in some blockchain. So you don't need these certificate agencies, for example, or they are, you don't have to trust them. You, but you need to trust the blockchain, like that the, the network is trustable. Uh, yeah, let's go. So they give some background. We covered everything, I think, decentralized identifiers. We covered it, verifiable credentials. So, and they have, uh, the, the paper structure is something similar. So say you need to write some introduction first. Uh, and uh, you need to write some background if it's necessary. In case of these topics, it's necessary because not much people know about decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials. Then you have you have to do some related work. What's related work? So it basically means like what has been done uh, similarly. Yeah, what 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 has been already done? Because uh, you should be able to um, make your paper outstanding from uh, previous work. So because you, you have more like you can say that you have some contribution. Uh, so I think here they covered some uh, user authentication methods of tra uh, like traditional ones. Uh, and 
and also they covered <coughs> SSI once. <clears throat> For example, British Columbia, uh, government of British Columbia implemented uh, VCO's authentication for uh, OpenID Connect uh, using the DITCOM protocol. So you can look into this actually, how they have done it. Uh, so British Columbia is, 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 uh, is in Canada, I think. So they are uh, quite, um, quite open to SSI implementations and they are pushing it. So they have some uh, proof of concepts or even uh, working implementations. And what else they mentioned? And they also mentioned this document by uh, Sabadella. I have read it. It's also why uh, gives you some general uh, knowledge about data authentication. And uh, yeah, so basically they just mentioned all, all, uh, all they mentioned this zero also. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, quite co comprehensive uh, related work. Uh, blockchain security public infrastructure. So it's more like DPKI. Okay, details. Let's skip these things. And how they have done implementation. Let's go there. So when integrating Open ID Connect standard, uh, you should identify some uh, schema. So they identified like in Open ID Connect, uh, you should uh, give this kind of uh, uh, like claims, like name, gender, phone number, email. So they identified what to include in a size schema, <clears throat> and in by Hyperledger Indie, you can create your own schema. So they created, uh, I think, uh, the schema based on Open ID Connect. So they tried to follow that. Mm. So the implementation uses Hyperledger Indie. And, and and sovereign network. So sovereign is uh, basically the blockchain they rely on. It's a nonprofit organization. And uh, so yeah, here it gives. So when using Hyperledger Indie, there should be some pairwise connection between uh, issuer and holder. So there should be, they should be connected before. And uh, knowledge about matching VC types. So this schema should follow the, the same pattern and knowing which user we are authenticating. So basically I think it means uh, verifying the DID of user. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That's right, but uh, there, there could be some uh, differences based on implementation and and here it's it's mostly i think uh, open id connect it has its own schema and uh, in order to integrate it you need to change the vc schema a bit so you need to add this uh, default values like this or some other stuff so your vc schema will be will be a bit different than uh, standard one so you they need to match uh, because of that so you are integrating traditional mechanism with the same mechanism, so yeah. So what else? So they talk about uh, distributed ledger-based public key infrastructure. Uh, yeah, I don't want to go through that. Do they have, ah, yeah, they have it. So they have uh, this <clears throat> flow. We have identity provider. Uh, it's it. He has his wallet, and we have a client. Uh, for example, some website, and we have uh, Open ID Connect provider, and distributed ledger. So, uh, so you scan QR code, send connection request, uh, uh, ask for proof, uh, and this Open ID Connect provider basically uh, asks you uh, some proofs. And when, when he asks you, you use your um, digital word and send the proofs. And verification happens uh, through distributed ledger as in, uh, uh, so basically looking into the ID document, I think. 
and he can, uh, if it's successful, he can give you the token and you just log in. Mm. Yeah, they, they mentioned what they used, for example, Hyperledger Indie, what SDK, and say I have done some evaluation. And conclusion, yeah. So here, uh, what else I can say? So he mentions like in conclusion, SSI movement has already contributed several feasible variants for authentication with OpenID Connect, including our proof of concept SSI OpenID Connect provider. So he uh, explicitly mentions that uh, there are already such uh, implementations, but we also contributed our uh, implementation. So like, so in terms of contribution, uh, it isn't very, uh, how to say, innovative thing, but uh, quite useful, I think, because uh, as it's quite early, you, you can try a, a different ways to integrate uh, and to, to implement stuff, yeah. Uh, well, let's go to the second one. This one is about blockchain-based verifiable credential sharing with selective disclosure. So uh, here they, they try to uh, implement selective disclosure with verifiable credentials. Um, they called it cred chain. Um, what else? Yeah, so they, uh, they rely on redactable signatures uh, to implement this selective disclosure. So basically they use the third method that we covered in the first part of lecture. So cryptographic solutions, they use cryptographic solutions to implement this selective disclosure. And the signature type uh, here, they use the redactable signatures. But in the lecture I mentioned, uh, you can use for example, BBS class signature. So uh, like, I mean, you can propose to use, uh, uh, like there are many ways to implement. So yeah, this is one way. Mm. So the credentials are managed through decentralized application, which allows users to store the credential data privately under full control. Yeah, so it's like, and uh, for, for if, uh, blockchain platforms, they use pari parity Ethereum. Parity, I think it's a client for Ethereum. So they used Ethereum, I think. So they made introduction regarding, uh, so they, they tried to mention privacy issues, GDPR, data minimization in their introduction. So they, to show they are, that they are uh, solving like important problem. Uh, and their architecture is cred chain. So the paper claims the following contribution. And here also, as you can see, they uh, explicitly mentioned what are their main contributions in the introduction part already. Uh, that paper also has done the similar thing, <clears throat> which makes it more clear, I think. Yeah. A selective disclosure scheme for credential sharing using redactable signatures. Our design is flexible in that the user has full control over of the credentials with regards to when, how long to share them and with whom. <clears throat> yeah. The second is SSI-focused decentralized architecture of credential management, which stores and shares credentials to from user world for web access. So it's just the architecture like wallet, they implemented wallet, <clears throat> uh, like whole mechanism. So yeah, I think that's, that's the case. Uh, they give basic scenario, I think, and the concept. So it's kind of background section. What is verifier? Uh, what is claim, for example, because what's credential, for example, and what's claim, the difference. The so credential is a temporary evidence set of statements made by an entity issuer, while claim is an assertion made about the recipient and generally consists of a subset of attributes. So it's kind of attributes, you may say. And it's part of the credential usually. So credential consists of 
uh, set of claims. And they, uh, they have done some background on selective disclosure techniques. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are many ways to implement it. Some sort of atomic credentials, atomic credentials, hashed values, selective disclosure signature, uh, which is mostly cryptography things here. And, 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 and here they mention what they have used. Uh, so they used uh, a reduction. It's a reductible signature was proposed by Johnson. <clears throat> and what he say like, it's a, it was like, uh, reduct means like uh, hide basically. When you show your credential, you hide some part of that and don't show it. So basically uh, the initial implementation was just uh, reducting uh, some bit positions, but they, um, but in here they, in uh, in case of bit, they uh, assumed it's like a claims. So they they uh, for every bit they um, they reduct claims, and the, the overall me mechanism uh, like uh, how uh, the signature is implemented is shown here. So it's based on Merkle tree and uh, this DGM uh, pseudo random generator. Uh, what is Merkle tree? If anyone knows, yep. Yeah, it's used in blockchain. Uh, that's right. So as you can see, like we have uh, leaves, uh, and uh, like this node, uh, middle node contains the hash of these ones, and it moves up, 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 and we have root node which is a hash uh, of all previous leaves or like how to say. So when verifying, you can just verify uh, the root that this satisfies. So you, uh, it means that everything is fine. Yeah, it will be shown here. So you will show uh, it uh, if something is changed here, for example, uh, and you can just look into this to verify and it will be different, so. That's how hashing, hashing works basically, but it's a tree. So, uh, so they, they have done some uh, how to architecture. So they, they, they have their own architecture kinda. They use some DAP server uh, because I think it's more uh, easier to in, implement, but uh, it's fine for proof of concepts to do so. Mm. And uh, yeah, they use JSON Web Token for uh, for this. Uh, how to say like for exchanging, and uh, they it also uh, shows the, the the time, like how much you how, how much uh, how long you have access, basically. Uh, they they have done some performance evaluations, like uh, as shown here. So like they usually me uh, measure this throughput, time response, transaction response time, uh, to uh, prove that their system is quite working, scalable, efficient, and so on. Mm. And they have done some privacy and security analysis. So I think when you do when you do some proof of concept, you should do this performance analysis, of course, and you should do some also some privacy and security analysis. But uh, doing security analysis is quite tough. Like uh, you you don't, but at least you can mention some issues, some um, some problems, like what could go wrong and so on. So at least in the paper you should mention that. As, as they did. So they didn't do, do some thorough security analysis, but they have uh, identified some attacks uh, which could occur and how to tackle them, just mentioned. But they have done this performance analysis. So in that case, your paper can get accepted. And they put a related work at the end. It's also, uh, I think they put it because they wanted to compare their implementation cred chain with others, yeah. So because of that, they did it because usually you have to put related work before uh, this implementation part. So they compared cred chain with uh, block thirds, sovereign, uport. Mm, it's quite 
how to say, very simple, not much data, not much things they included. What is SD? SD means selective disclosure, possibly. So, uh, so RIN and Uport has selective disclosure, others don't have, and, and they have. And here it TCA. Time constrained access. It's what Jason J, JWT did here. So yeah. So so yeah. I cannot say uh, like whether it's true. Like but yeah. So basically, it, that's it uh, from questions. I think I asked about Miracle Tree hashing. Yeah, that's enough. Uh, I think it's kind of server, okay. yeah, okay. not the agent, but yeah. Uh, so as I said, like they used in the middle some server, which is fine for proof of concept. So they provide GitHub links, I think. So, uh, so as you can see, there are these papers which have done some work. So when you do the, the proof of concept, you can look into them and how people has done, has done it. Like, so you can learn from that. Like, so as you can see, you can simplify these things when you do this proof of concepts. You don't have to implement ideal architecture. So you can assume some stuff and uh, make it more simpler, but to showcase that, yeah, yeah your idea, okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, simplified one, yeah. So uh, that's sent for today. Uh, for for next week, I don't, uh, I think Marish will have some lecture. Yeah. Uh, you can continue to help it. There's a question regarding that presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, are you familiar with Discord? Discord, yeah. Yeah, and Discord has a chat up against me. Um, a way to log into your Discord account or your computer is to open the application and scan a QR code. Mm. But you never make any things uh, on the computer about your account. You just scan the QR code with the Discord app and then you just get a phone yeah it's like a similar to whatsapp yeah i would assume that what it does is that it has some sort of web page or something that you, I, I, I did a look at the QR code and there's no there's a web page mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. and i assume that the my Discord application sends some sort of authentication token. Yeah. Something with my information. Don't know if it comes for passwords, but it should come for to a server or whatever. No, no. Tells that my internet needs to log in. Yeah. In this computer. Yeah. I assume that they've done it. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, it's and the thing is here, like here, verifier and issue are the same. Discord itself, mm -hmm. and you are your holder and you want to log in and uh issue is discord the verifier is also discord and they use just tokens to transfer it and they uh, say like how long you can have access in your laptop and uh, i think when you log in next time you have to do it again no, no, yeah really. not really no it's the same as logging in whether but 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 when you your uh for example when you're uh one one is offline you cannot access that one yeah yeah. Um, yeah, because you need to have like internet access and access to your phone app that is yeah. to log in yeah. and authenticate and all this kind of stuff. And I do believe that they just count it as a normal password login, but I assume they just pass a token that just says, I am me and we trust 
owner. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, you are verifying that you have this form. So, so that's the thing, I think. Like you, you are verifying that you own this form and you own uh, the access with your phone. And by the way, so you can have access in your laptop also. Like it's kind of, yeah, it's token based too. But in te Telegram, they use a bit different mechanism. So when you log in with your <clears throat> laptop and phone, you don't ha have to. I mean, they can work uh, both. You, they can work separately, so you don't need to be all online on your phone to access your uh, laptop uh, Telegram app. So it's quite different mechanism. I don't know exactly how it works, but they they claim they use some encryption mechanisms and it's secure and so on. Uh, so you can have access uh, on your laptop and mobile phone. Yeah, but uh, the, the thing is with this mechanism, like you have to be online on your mobile phone and yeah, yeah so so that's kind of drawback, but otherwise, yeah, it's quite yeah, quite fine. Uh, as, like I said, you, you to access a button, 